Hello and welcome to the first Lawn Products webinar. I'm Ken Landau. I'm a staff engineer here at AIST. This webinar will focus on SBQ cold bar finishing with an overview of black bar and bright bar processing, including key considerations for safety, quality, and productivity. As with all AIST functions, the, we'll review the antitrust guidelines. There we go. So do not discuss with others your own or competitors prices, pricing procedures, or anything that might affect pricing such as costs, discounts, terms of sale, profit margins, or anticipated wage rates. Do not make statements about your own pricing or those of your competitors. Do not talk about what individual companies plan to do in particular markets or with particular customers. So again, if we could follow those guidelines, that'd be great. Next, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Fabris, who are located in Ontario, Canada. Fabris Incorporated is a leader in precision machining, a solu solutions provider. Their highly trained team uses new technology to design and manufacture high precision components and equipment for a variety of industries with an emphasis on long products in the metals industry. As they begin their celebration for their 50th anniversary, Fabris continues with the promise to provide innovative solutions, product excellence, and value to their customers. They are committed to maintaining strong key supplier relationships, providing their customers with total quality assurance, continuous cost improvement, and on-time delivery. With that, I'd like to go through a few things we uh, need to go through here. First, the attendee audio has been disabled. Any of the questions can be submitted using the question and answer tab on the screen. The, uh, myself and the moderator will review some of the questions and uh, prepare them for George, the presenter. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand replay at AIST's website. And if you're having any tef, tef, excuse me, technical difficulties, you can email training at AIST.org. Another important reminder, photos and recording of this presentation is strictly prohibited. Again, you will be given a link to the, access the presenter contact information in the recordings following the end of the webinar. Now let me introduce our moderator, Chris Petrie, who is the Roll Shop Supervisor at Steel Dynamics Structural and Rail Division. Chris, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Ken. Um, <clears throat> I want to welcome George Burnett today, uh, the sales manager from Bultman US LP. Uh, he'll be giving the presentation. He's volunteered to do that for us today for our first webinar. Uh, George received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and German from the University of Iowa, as well as receiving master's degrees in uh, systems engineering from Virginia Tech and secondary education from Slippery Rock University. Uh, he is currently the sales manager at Bultman US LP. Uh, prior to that, he was the director of Bloom Combustion Services. Uh, before that, he was the manager at SMS Elotherm. Uh, prior to being with SMS, he was the general manager at IMS Measuring Systems. Um, before that, he was a mechanical engineer with Arconic, or formerly known as Alcoa. Um, George, uh, appreciate you uh, stepping up and doing this first one for us today. We're 
uh, breaking some new ground and uh, we'll let you take it from there. There. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. This is my first time doing this as well and you'll probably be able to tell that uh, um, I'm a, a newbie at this. Um, but uh, yeah, with this presentation, I decided, you know, since we're kind of living in a time when, when the whole world seems to be a little bit upside down, I would turn the presentation upside down to fit right in. You know, typically in a presentation like this, there'll be some talk, some content, and then they'll ask for questions. And I just flip that over. So for the last three, four weeks or so, I've been asking folks for their questions and you know, what they would like to see in the presentation. Uh, and then built the presentation around that. So we went with questions first and then presentation second. Uh, it's kind of a novel concept that, you know, asking people what they like before we try to give it to them. So hopefully this works out well. Um, are, is the uh, audio okay? Are you able to hear me with the acoustics? Okay. All right. Uh, let me go ahead then and I'll share my screen. Okay, no, nope, that's not what we wanted. Let's try this again. As I said, it's my first time. Okay, so I'm still not sure where there. Are you seeing the presenter slides? Or are you seeing the presentation now? Yeah, in we're the seeing the presentation where we're seeing the main one and the next file. Oh, okay, next well, let me try this one more time. Maybe third time will be the charm. How are we doing now? Perfect. Okay, <laughs> so, all right. So again, thank you all very much for making time to join us today. Uh, to begin with, um, before I launch right into the questions and the responses to those questions, I thought it'd be helpful to do a brief overview of the SBQ bar cold finishing process. Uh, I know that you know the veterans in the audience, this will be um, known content for you, but there might be some folks with us who are not as familiar. So I thought it'd be good just to give that context before we begin. So um, let me, uh, there we go. Oh, okay. Well, let me introduce uh, Biltman just for a moment uh, so you'll know who we are. And um, Biltman is a, a provider uh, of cold finishing equipment and complete processing lines. Uh, that's for tubular products and also for long products like the SBQ bar that we're talking about today. Um, probably the main equipment that we're known for would be our straightening machines, our drawing machines, and our peelers. Uh, but I'll talk, I'll talk about this some today too. The material handling and the automation that goes along with that is essential to the uh, success of these operations. So uh, that's definitely gonna be part of what we talk about today as well. So the overview, um, three main areas I'll talk about, it's black bar processing, bright bar processing, and the drawing process, and then on to the answers to your questions. Uh, starting with the black bar process, um, a typical, this isn't the way it always is, but a typical scenario would be that there'll be some kind of a singulation and infeed device to take a bundle of bars and get them loaded into the process. Uh, next step could be shot blasting to remove the mill scale and the hot, the hot roll finish or, or scale buildup. Then typically straightening and a straightness measurement that's online. Uh, then chamfering, um, there'll be some NDT testing there may or may not be a cut to length and end finishing, depending on what happens to the bars next. And then the bundling, again, depending on where the bars are going next, they could be tightly hex bundled or it could be a loose bundle that's just suitable for transport to the next step in the operation. So I appreciate that what I'm showing you now is an eye chart. So uh, 
I'm going to switch to the drawing itself. This is a layout for a representative black bar process. All right, and hopefully you are now seeing the, the drawing of the layout. Good. So I'm going to scroll out on here just a little bit. So we can see the overall shape of this layout. And again, I appreciate that uh, this is an eye chart on your screen. It's, it's going to be difficult, but uh, rest assured, it will zoom into some of the particulars here in a moment. So there's, there's two general trends that you'll see in a process like this. They could be either a U-shaped product flow or it could be an inline product flow. This particular example is a U-shape, but in fact, the actual layout is going to depend on the space available and the process requirements and so forth. And you know, there's, there's never two that are just the same. They're always uh, configured and customized to some extent according to the particulars of, of the situation. Um, if we start with this, what you're seeing here, zooming in, is the infeed device. So that's going to be um, a, a cradle, or it could be two or three cradles where you might load multiple bundles, uh, which would free up your crane operator to do other, other work. And that would uh, automatically index one bundle after another into the, uh, the system. Um, again, I, I mentioned the material handling is really essential to the success of these operations. Uh, it's, it's easy to fixate on you know, the big pieces of equipment like the straightener or a peeler. But if you can't get the bars to and through your process, then uh, yeah, you're 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 not you're not going to achieve your your objectives. Um, and the the infeed device is 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 really really critical to all of this. And in particular, in a bright bar line, or excuse me, a black bar line, you're you're apt to get some incoming bars that can be pretty ugly. Um, not not to disparage any of my friends in the hot rolling side, but uh, for example, if these bars have been normalized uh, through the heat treat operation, they can come out with a pretty squirrely uh, non-straightness and you need equipment that, that is able to cope with that and do it automatically. Uh, so the next step in this is the shot blaster. And that's again to remove the, the mill scale. I'll talk a little bit about that later. I know some folks have asked the question, why, why do we propose a shot blaster? Uh, so I'll get to that. George, uh -huh. can I interrupt just a second? Yes. We're we're still seeing the overview of the line, right? Oh, I am sorry. Let me uh, make a quick change. Thank you, Ken, for letting me know. Excuse me just one second. There, that should help. Hopefully you're doing a little better now. <laughs> okay, so we'll back up again. This is, this is the infeed table, the bar singulation and infeed, and then going to the shot blaster. And then next step here is uh, feeding the bars into a multi-roll straightener. And uh, you know, one, one decision right away is, do you go with a two-roll straightener or a multi-roll straightener? Um, typically, in a situation like this, we'll go with the uh, two-roll or the multi-roll device because it has much, much higher throughput. So it's, it's able to, the, the cycle time is so much quicker than you can do with a two-roll straightener. Um, out of the straightener, then, we'll have um, an inline straightness measuring device so that we can immediately at the straightener exit uh, verify that the straightener is performing and producing bars according to spec. And then there'll be some means to either allow the bars to continue through the process or if the bars fail to meet the straightness spec to discharge them into um, some kind of a discharge cradle where they can be retrieved and either run through a straightener again or whatever needs to happen with them before they would continue. Um, 
mixing here, and it wouldn't necessarily always be here, but um, it would be a chamfering station. And I'll zoom in a little bit farther. And, and the point of this in chamfering the head end is uh, depending on the cut of the bar that you're getting in from the hot mill or from whatever upstream process, you may or may not have a pristine bar end. If you have like a burr or a lip or if it's been sheared and so it's distorted or bent, uh, that can be a problem going into your NDT. And the last thing you want to do is tear up your expensive and sensitive NDT equipment with, with an ugly head end on a bar. Uh, so that would be one reason why uh, some folks need to have a, a chamfering station, at least on the head end. And then the next step here would be going to a testing table and the testing table uh, would include the usual suspects like an eddy current, uh, ultrasonic testing. There may also be a dimensional measurement there and usually some kind of a marking system so that any flaws or anything can be marked on the bar, for example, with a paint system. Uh, continuing on through this then, I'll scroll back out a little bit. There'll be a decision point here if the bars come to the NDT and they're all looking good and they're okay, then in this case, we're gonna continue down on the screen to a multi-head sawing station. And the sawing station would then cut the long, let's call it like the mother bars into the shorter daughter products. And um, with multiple cutting heads, this can be done where you're doing all of the cuts simultaneously, again, to, to keep the throughput of the whole line up. Um, and maybe I'll just talk a moment about throughput. A general strategy when you're laying out a line like this is to um, have your slowest step of the process up front and every step that comes after that, in general, you want it to be faster, to have a shorter cycle time. And the reason for that is that uh, if there's any kind of a disruption, it's easier to recover and your overall productivity will be better if the gatekeeping item or the, the, the pacemaker is early on in your process and not at the tail end of your process. So um, now after the bars have been cut, of course, then we have saw cut ends. And uh, at that point, then we would put in the facing and chamfering. And facing is an option, whether that's necessary or not, it depends. Um, there could also be a marking station. The marking could be a pin stamper or it could be a laser ablation etcher. Uh, might be doing like a barcode or a QR code or something like that. And then uh, from there, we're going to a hex bundler. And the hex bundler then, uh, as the name suggests, would give you a, a tight hex bundle. Um, if you're in an operation where all of these bars are simply going to an internal customer and you have no requirement for a tight bundle, then you may not need a hex bundler here. But uh, in this particular example, we're having that. And then there's a discharge table where multiple bundles can be presented and they're ready to be picked up by the crane. So next step, I'm going to stop sharing this and get back to the presentation. After seeing it uh, on a drawing and hearing me talk about it, uh, let's see, hopefully you're seeing my presentation now. Thought we'd do a short video where you could see one of these in operation. I need to find where that video is. You'll excuse me again. <laughs> We're gonna go sharing a different screen.
All right, here we go. So are you seeing now a built-in logo? Good, okay. We'll go ahead and let this get going. Believe me, I'll get better at this as we go. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier on, the, um, the material handling is, is really critical to the success of any processing line like this uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and if you can't get the bars loaded, then you know you've lost the you've lost the war before the first battle. So uh, I wanted to show this example here of a system for getting in some very non-ideal bars loaded. Um, these are bars that have been heat treated, so they're pretty squirrely. And what you'll see is that this is a fully automatic machine. Um, all the operator has to do is load a bundle at the, the infeed cradle and basically hit go and walk away. And that's, that's essential for a lot of reasons. One is of course the productivity, but the most important reason I think is the safety of the system that uh, you don't have to have any manual intervention in order to keep the process running. Nobody has to reach in with tools or, or any other means to assist this by hand. Um, the way this system works, you know, we'll, we'll load a whole bundle, we'll then bring a, a subset of that bundle, uh, maybe a half dozen or 10 bars or so over on a lateral conveyor, and then we have a finger separating unit that is able to grasp the bars and get them one at a time loaded to the uh, in-feed conveyor, which in this case is going into, as you might guess, a straightener. <laughs> so. But what you can see with this is these bars, they're, they're not pretty. Um, they're, they're really, you know, disorganized. Uh, they have serious straightness issues down the length of the bar as a result of the normalizing operation. And nevertheless, you know, the system is able to fully automatically handle the bars and get them fed into the rest of the processing line. Okay, well, I'll do one more here and then be on our way. Okay, what I'm going to do next here is load up um, another video. Okay. 
So this is a black bar processing line that uh, is located in Germany. Um, this is not identical to the one that we saw in the drawing, but uh, again, as I said, every single one of these is a little different according to the customer requirements and the layout. Uh, this has a multi-role straightener, chamfering facing, and various material handling equipment. So as you can see, these bars, they're looking pretty clean. Again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. They've already been through a shot blaster. And they've already come through an automatic uh, loading table. Now they're being transferred into a multi-role straightener. Here you can see a view of the bars passing through the multi-role. As I mentioned, we, we like multi-roles in a situation like this because uh, their throughput, their cycle time compared to two-roll is much, much quicker. One thing you might notice about this, the arrangement of the rolls is very, very compact. Uh, what we find is that a, a 10 roll straightener like this would fit easily into the footprint that used to be occupied, let's say, by a six roll straightener. And of course, it offers a lot more in terms of performance and flexibility than, than an old six roll might be able to provide. Uh, coming out of the straightener then, the bars are transferring on to um, chamfering and facing. And here we have double stations to meet the throughput requirements so we can simultaneously work on two bars at each end. So you can see how this works where we'll, we'll index over to one side to do one end of the bar and then the, the bar will traverse over to the other side of the table to get the other end done. And then from there, we'll be ready to head off to uh, a bundling station or whatever step needs to happen next. Okay. So one of the questions, and this came in from several folks, um, why are we so keen to do um, shock blasting? And uh, I'll answer it this way. I think of it like brushing my teeth in the morning. So it takes time and it costs a little bit of money. So in the short term, it's, it's, it's only a cost center. However, uh, over time, um, in the long term, it's definitely uh, helpful. And in fact, uh, less expensive than life without brushing my teeth. Um, now a little bit perhaps more technical response is that when you look at the NDT, of course, there's two types of errors, right? There's the, the type one and type two error. One is the risk of missing a flaw and incorrectly saying the bar is okay. The other type of error is indicating the presence of a flaw or, or that, that doesn't really exist. And, and both of these are expensive. And both of those risks can be reduced by uh, having a shot blasted finish going into the NDT. So you're able to be more accurate and more precise um, with your NDT um, if you present uh, a good surface to the, to the equipment. Now I understand that uh, some of the NDT OEMs would, will probably say if you ask them, do you need a shot blaster? They'll say, mm, no, we can get along without it. Um, to that I'd say though, bear in mind that, you know, in, in the context of that conversation, uh, the, the OEM for the NDT equipment is probably concerned about cost. And if they know that you are evaluating their equipment and maybe two or three other suppliers, and they're the only ones who say, yeah, you should really get the shot blaster, then that's gonna make them look expensive. <laughs> so they might be reluctant from a commercial perspective to suggest that you should include a shot blaster in your, in your black bar line. All right, so let me move on to the bright bar process. Um, the main steps, again, of course, you have a singulation and feed, then pre-straightening, peeling, straightening and polishing, or it might be burnishing, um, then straightness measurement and NDT, cutting to length, chamfering and bundling. So here's what that might look like. In this case, it's an inline process instead of a U shape. 
And let me go straight to the video. I promise I'm going to get faster at this. So this, again, is another bright wire line in Germany. And in fact, it's the same plant where we saw the black bars being processed before. So these are black bars that came from that same line that we were watching a few minutes ago. Um, and again, we have a bar infeeds in singulation. And using the same general tactic of um, offloading a few bars at a time and then doing a finger se separation to get the bars one at a time and feed them in to the pre-straightener. The next step here will be going into the peeler. And then coming through the peeler, Again, with automated material handling, uh, I'm going to pause this here just for a moment. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more here in a slide or two, but I'll just call your attention to the left side of your screen. And what you'll see there is an online straightness measuring system or center. And this is configured such that uh, we can do straightness checks on the bars without uh, disrupting the process flow. So everything can keep on running while we're doing our straightness checks. And then at that point, uh, when the bar is done with its measurement, we can reintroduce it to the line. Or if for some reason the bar fails a test, we can kick it out to uh, basically a not OK reject cradle. So there you can see a bar that's been measured and now it's reintroduced to the line. And then here we have our facing and chamfering. And then next step is going to be the, uh, the exit bundling. And I'll pause this here too, just for a moment. Um, if you look here, you might notice that there's more than one easy down cradle that can be seen in this picture. And the reason for that is that we can be loading one easy down cradle with bars coming off the line while we're presenting the other cradle to the crane operator to offload the system. So the crane operator can come in and grab a bundle while the next bundle is being populated. Okay. I'll stop this here for a moment and we'll go back to our presentation. So now getting on to some of the questions that folks had asked, um, Zach in Michigan wrote, if I could request information about the uh, automation of the cold drawn as a topic, that would be great. And Zach, yes, you can request that. And that is great. I'm glad you asked. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about here with respect to cold drawing automation applies equally, at least here, to any cold finishing operation. Uh, if you imagine a Venn diagram and you have three centers of interest, that's safety, uh, quality, and productivity. And then what actions you can take that would be impactful in all three of those centers of interest, automation certainly fits that criteria. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit here. But that's one, one thing you can do with good automation and material handling, you can improve the safety, quality, and productivity of the operation. So we'll start talking about the safety. And, and I, I kind of have a passion for the material handling because some of the shops that we've been into, especially ones that have older equipment and that might have small lot sizes, um, tend to have 
less automation and material handling that requires a lot of human intervention. So there's a, a maybe a processing line that runs like a job shop and that line might require 10 people to run it per shift. And eight of those people are busy just manually assisting the material handling in one way or another. And with each of those interactions between the operators and the material and the moving equipment, there is at least a potential risk uh, for safety of upper extremity injury, a repetitive motion injury, a lower back injury, and so forth. To the extent that you can eliminate that and free up those people to do other more interesting work, you've also taken them out of potential harm's way. Another thing with respect to safety uh, is that, uh, you know, the setup and the operation of the equipment, if that can be automated so the operators aren't having to go in with tools and make manual changes to machines every time you switch products, again, you've eliminated that opportunity for injury. And with respect to maintenance, a lot of things that traditionally have been done with respect to preventative and predictive maintenance can be assisted by automation. Again, to reduce the, the likelihood or the potential for a human to get into a place where they could be hurt while working on the machine. So let me start with this one. You see two images here in front of you, and both of these images, they have something in common. There's a critical piece of equipment that is present and visible in both of these pictures. And I'll let you think about that just for a moment before I, I go on. So what I'm getting at is all of the kinetic activity is on one side of the fence and the people, other than the race car drivers, are on the other side of the fence. And that's really what we're after. When we do processing lines, even for job shops that have small lot sizes, it's very feasible to do automation and material handling to a point where there's no need for people to be anywhere near anything that moves. They can be on the other side of the fence, and that's what we're after. So another thing with respect to this uh, is quality after safety. And when I talk about quality, really two things generally come up. That's precision and accuracy. So in this graphic, it's one I've, I've liked for a long, long time, uh, just to define what we're talking about with precision and accuracy. And if you see like in the upper right corner, that's a highly precise, highly accurate process. It's precise because you have a very tight grouping and it's accurate because that grouping is centered right on target. Um, what you see then to the left on the upper side is a nice, tight, precise grouping, but it's off target. So it's precise, but not accurate. On the bottom right, you have an accurate process, but it's not precise, so it's not very repeatable. And then of course, the worst case scenario is the lower left, which is not precise and not accurate. In general, of course, what you want is precise and accurate. If you can get precise, but it's not accurate, that's usually something that can be fixed uh, and not with a lot of cost. Um, that's just a matter of calibrating and, and sort of re-aiming your equipment. But uh, if you have uh, an imprecise system, then uh, short of really substantial changes to the equipment, chances are it's going to be difficult to make a meaningful improvement in terms of quality. So with cold drawing op automation, that was what the, the question was, we want to produce or reduce the process variation, of course. Uh, other things that we can do is, uh, and this is true with other cold finishing operations, you can track every single work piece through the process. And, you know, for example, we have uh, maybe a laser device that's stenciling a QR code on every bar or on every piece. And that QR code could then be married to all of the information about everything that happened in the process and uh, the complete history of that bar. And it's there pretty much in perpetuity in case in the future anyone needs to know. And again, with the maintenance, you know, the predictive and preventative tools that you can add with, with good automation can only help the quality, right? So. And then with productivity, uh, rapid setup and changeover. Um, with drawing, for example, one thing that comes to mind is uh, if you have an automatic die 
alignment and adjustment. So the, the draw bench, for example, has a mechanism to track each individual die. That could be an RFID tag or it could be a barcode or something like that. And when that die is loaded into the bench, if it has been used before, then the bench could recognize that die and say, okay, I remember you. And I remember last time you were in here, we had you aligned this way to get us a straight product. And I'm going to reproduce that setting right now. That works because the draw bench is already equipped with a servo controlled die alignment mechanism. So when it's time for the operator to switch over and put in a new die and start the process, if the operator needs to make a change in the die alignment, there's no tools involved. There's no like opening up the safety gate and going in and working on the, the, the die block. Instead, the operator is doing that from a touch screen. And once he gets it set where he wants it or she gets it set where she wants it, then the, the PLC will remember that and that becomes part of the information that goes with that die. So that's just one example of the kinds of things that we can do to, to speed up and, and improve the productivity with, with the, the drawing operation. Uh, intelligent responses to online NDT and dimensional measurements, that too is part of it. And I appreciate that uh, it's 1242 here, so I'm gonna try to keep things moving. <laughs> but uh, another, by the way, uh, this is a question from Dan in Michigan. This is the Michigan um, presentation today. You know, I asked for questions and I got the questions from Michigan. So we're gonna do this 49 more times so the people in the other states have a chance to participate as well. But every single question I had was from Michigan, so okay. <laughs> but anyway, he asked for information about change over time reductions and the initial straightness out of the die, and that's kind of what I just touched on. Uh, but of course, it's always good if you can get a movie. So let me switch over to a film where you can see what this looks like in action. So I'm going to fast forward through this because the beginning of this film shows um, automation work that we did for basically a series of dunk tanks for, for cleaning and etching and so forth. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna fly by that and get on to the parts that are most interesting to uh, the SBQ audience here. Okay, so here we go. So we're coming out of the, the last of the tanks. And these bars are going on to the draw bench. I'm gonna pause here just for a moment, okay. You may have noticed on these bars, they're not pointed, they haven't been swaged. And this is another thing that can be done to really enhance the productivity of an operation is if you have a draw bench with a push-in device, then rather than having to do a separate pointing operation for each bar and then put it on and bring it to the draw bench, um, we do that all in one step here. So we have a push-in device that will grab these unpointed bars, put them through the die to create the point and then grasp the bar uh, with the carriage and continue this all in one smooth operation. So, you know, the bar goes through the die, it never stops moving, we grab it with the carriage and just continue the draw. So here you're seeing the entry, the bar is approaching. It's coming up toward the die block. Getting into the push-in device. The push-in device, what you see here, there goes the bar into the die block and we're going to grab it, push it through the die to actually create the point. And then on the other side, what you see here is the carriage. In this particular instance, you're seeing a, a single head draw bench, but uh, of course it could be a double or triple or even a quadruple head draw bench. Uh, this bench is a rack and pinion style, which again, we're pretty fond of. Uh, it offers some really nice advantages over let's say a chain style bench. 
uh, in that you can have a continuously variable profile during the draw on your force and on your velocity. Uh, there's, it's also very smooth. You know, the, with the chain, you're going to have little kinematic uh, imperfections. With each link of the chain, it's a little, little bit of chop. Um, with a rack and pinion, it's just a silky smooth draw. So the kinematic control of the drawing process is just much more precise. And it gives you a lot of tools you can work with with respect to your speed and force that aren't available with the, the other types of draw benches. Okay. So moving along here. So another question, of course, from Michigan. Randy in Michigan asks, you'd like to see information about defects that can be created, root causes, and how to correct them. That's, that's a good question. I mean, of course, we only have a few minutes here, so let me just give one example. And that would be out of round bars. So if you can imagine, and this is pretty typical, coming out of a hot mill, um, that you might have, um, a distortion that out of roundness caused by the, the three roll sizing block. And what that could look like might be something like this. You can see there's actually six lobes. And with a three roll block and you have one, one block and then it's offset by, I think about this, 60 degrees to the other block so that you end up getting the, um, the three roll from one block and then the and then the trilobe from the other block, every other block, and then as a result, you can get this this sixth lobe uh, deviation from roundness on the bars. And then that comes to the cold finishing guys, and the cold finishing guys have to deal with it. <laughs> so so there you go. Um, and looking at this, we can see um, you know, we have an out of roundness uh, of about 56 micrometers. And uh, the question then is, what can we do about this in the peeler? If we run this, in this case, uh, th through a peeler that was equipped with um, uh, six um, cutting heads and reduce the, uh, the eccentricity, or I'm sorry, the, the out of roundness to about 13 micrometers. However, what you see here is if we run this with a peeler equipped with only four heads, we're somewhere around, again, I'm sorry, that's 56. And with six heads, we're getting down to about 14. So really you've reduced it down to about 25% of what it would have been simply by increasing the number of heads in your peeling machine. I mean, another technique that some folks will do is, you know, you can just reduce the infeed rate on your peeler. Um, and that gave some improvement. You can see this here that a four head machine with an infeed rate of only 16 feet per minute was able to reduce the out of roundness to about 25 micrometers. But you're paying a price for that. I mean, a peeler is already typically the slowest step in the operation. And now, you know, you've cut your productivity by maybe 40% in order to improve the out of roundness. Uh, on the other hand, adding um, cutting heads or, or heads to your cutting tool, uh, you can run more or less at full speed and dramatically reduce the out of roundness error. So that's just one example. Uh, another one from Randy. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, by the way, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> is the proper way to measure cold finish straightness? Is there's there's an ASTM, I think it's 108A is a spec, but uh, it's somewhat general. And what you see in practice is some people are measuring uh, the straightness on three foot centers, some on five foot centers, some are doing a, <coughs> excuse me, a support and overhang. Um, let me just start uh, by talking about <coughs> what, what we will typically do and that is we'll measure straightness on one meter centers. And you saw this in the video earlier. And the way we're doing this is you see these rotating disc here in the image. Those will be spinning the bar 
And then between each pair of discs, we have a TIR measurement. So we're measuring in this case on one, one meter centers up and down the whole length of the bar. What that would look like on video One moment. So let's see, are you seeing my screen now? Okay, good. So again, you can see the bars are over here that's getting spun on these discs and then coming back and being reintroduced into the line. And with that, uh, we're, we're getting a series of runout measurements at every one meter centers down the length of the bar. Um, and we can also adjust the in stop or the justification of the bar so we can have whatever overhang we think we want to have uh, from the end of the bar to the very first measurement point. So if you have a customer that has a particular preference, that's something that we can set up. Now to get on to Randy's question, simply showing him what we do isn't enough. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, um, in addition to being a mechanical engineer, at one time I was a, a geometry teacher uh, in high school math and physics. Um, so of course I'm always asking, is there a mathematical solution? <laughs> and uh, Usually you can help things with math. Um, and in fact, in this case, there is like, there's some simple things you can do. And this goes back to like the stuff I used to teach the high school kids and they were in ninth grade uh, using a Pythagorean theorem and a little bit of triangle geometry. Um, what you can do with this is you can convert the TIR measurement that say is collected on a one meter center to what the equivalent result would be if you'd been measuring on five feet, just by using the arithmetic and these equations here. Um, so if I continue on, in this case, you know, I just did a simple calculation using uh, those, those, those formulas to convert from what happens if you measure your TIR on one meter centers and what it would look like if you were measuring it the same bar on five foot centers. So that's, that's one, one thing we can offer. Um, I don't know that there's ever gonna be a full agreement among all the stakeholders on what method of measurement they wanna see. So being able to convert from one to another might be a useful approach. So another question from Michigan, Jody asks, what are the current trends in factory 4.0 or industry 4.0? So if we look at industry 4.0, what he's referring to, of course, is the, the fourth industrial revolution. So the first one was basically the age of steam power. And the second one would be the age of, let's say the railroad and the beginnings of assembly line manufacturing. The third revolution is basically the computer and highly automated, sophisticated manufacturing. And the fourth is what we are really getting into now, which is the internet of things and highly communicative systems where machines are talking to machines and they're doing through artificial intelligence or machine intelligence, many of the tasks that used to require human intervention. So if we look at industry 4.0 by different sectors, um, the metals industry has been perhaps a little bit behind the curve compared to others. Uh, but having said that, um, the metals industry, what we see is, is making up for lost time. There's a lot, a, a lot of progress that's happening right now. It's a very kind of a, an exciting time, I think, for the adoption of industry 4.0 principles in, in the work that we do in the world that we live in. Um, I'm a big fan of Peter Drucker. And I think among the various pearls of wisdom that, uh, that he's provided over his, his career, I thought this was a great one, right? If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you can't manage it, you can't improve it. 
And in the case of Industry 4.0, what we're able to do is take these things of measuring, managing, and improving, and, and facilitate that with artificial intelligence and with the, the automation and the machine controls. Uh, so what that means with respect to, to Biltman, I can give some general guidance here. Um, and some of this is very proprietary, but certainly we're looking at things where machines will set up and configure themselves without human intervention. That's, that's essential. That almost goes without saying. Uh, also looking at uh, machines that um, will diagnose themselves and simply go beyond the, you know, issuing a fault to the operator or, or to the maintenance, but instead communicate that condition to any remote stakeholder and initiate corrective actions, perhaps with, um, you know, a permissive from an operator or a maintenance tech to go ahead and, and make a corrective action, again, without a human picking up a tool and going inside the area that has a fence. So that's part of it. Uh, another thing, and you know, we've done this for years already, is we track every single bar as it goes through the line. So we know its history. Uh, and we also know now, that with the increased data that's available to us, all of the process parameters and what the operators were doing during that time. And with that, we can optimize our settings and our parameters and our setup. So if we see a trend emerging where uh, the operators, the humans are are intervening in a particular setup in our process, and it's indicative of a shift that needs to be made in the, in the parameters of that process, it'll automatically propose that to the operator and say, look, we, we see what you're up to here, and we think this is where you want to go, and uh, if you concur, then we'll go ahead and load this change. Uh, so instead of waiting for a human again to intervene in a manual sense, <coughs> the the system will be proactive in suggesting improvements to the operators. So I think we're just about out of time and I'm just about out of slides. So uh, let me stop with that. And uh, if we have a, a moment for any additional questions or things like that, I'd be, be happy to, to help out. We did not receive any other additional questions on top of the ones that you have. Uh, if there is anybody else that does have a question, uh, please enter it now. Um. Nah, it's a good thing I got the questions first. <laughs> Yeah, if, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I would like to again thank George uh, Burnett for, for doing this first webinar for us, um, as well as Fabris for sponsoring this uh, first event for us. Um, hopefully we'll uh, continue to do some more and, and keep growing with these. Uh, this event was organized uh, by the AIST Long Products Committee. Uh, upcoming webinars will be available at AIST.org. Uh, so continue to check back there or look. You'll probably get emails as well for reminders when new ones are coming up. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for the uh, the opportunity. I appreciate this. Um, I, I will say uh, there, there was a question that, that I got that I was not able to incorporate simply because the answer would have taken the whole hour, and that was how to optimize the setup on a straightening machine. Um, and uh, that's, that's an awesome question, but that's when we're, I guess we have to just take it to the parking lot. But if anyone has other questions like that, <coughs> you know, certainly we feel that it's part of our role in this, in this industry to be helpful whenever we can. So please feel free to reach out. And thank you, George. We certainly appreciate it. And thanks again to our sponsor, Fabris. And that should conclude it. Whoops. Thanks again, all. Thank you.